The line for the Americans to watch will be Lamaru and Lamaru. Monique Lamaru Morando, a two-time silver medalist. It's Jocelyn Lamaru Davidson, number 17 in blue. The Lamaru twins are from Grand Forks, North Dakota, youngest of six children. Jocelyn Lamaru, nice finesse move. Oh my! The bar! This is her twin sister Monique. She scores! And Jocelyn Lamaru scores the eighth goal. Now Lamaru cuts to the net and scores! A hat trick for Monique Lamaru! Run for Monique Lamaru! Score! They're so tenacious. That is a highlight goal. Score! Finish shown, and now it's Lamaru with a chance. A Chubby score! More Lamarus. Keep putting them out there. Score! Talk about the twin intuition, and you see it there. Jocelyn Lamaru, a two time silver, comes again and scores! Lamaru does it again! Back to back strikes for Jocelyn Lamaru Davidson right off the face off. Jocelyn Lamaru, what a move! Long pass ahead to Monique Lamaru, moving in on Zalmanas. She scores! Monique Lamaru has tied the game at two. Jocelyn Lamaru, two goals apiece in the shootout. Lamaru moving in on Zabanas. She deeks and scores! That's electrifying. That's as good as you're going to see anywhere. The United States wins gold in Pyeongchang. The Lamaru ladies stepped up gigantic in this gold medal game. It's been a part of our dream to do this together and to do it in the way we did. It's just we couldn't have written a better script. How cool is it to have to go through something like this with your sister? Dream come true. It's a dream come true. It is now my pleasure to introduce this morning's speakers, Jocelyn and Monique Lamaru. Jocelyn and Lamaru Davidson and Monique Lamaru Mirando are twin sisters from Grand Forks, North Dakota, who represented the United States on the 2010 2014, and 2018 Winter Olympic teams. Together, they have won two Olympic silver medals, an Olympic gold medal, and six world championships. Since the Olympics, they have both become mothers, are brand ambassadors for Comcast's corporate values initiatives, and recently started the Monique and Jocelyn Lamru Foundation. The sisters are widely admired for their outstanding work ethic, as well as their efforts to fight for equality in hockey. Not only did they petition against the University of North Dakota's decision to cut the women's ice hockey team, but they also led a player boycott and congressional lobbying to encourage the USA Hockey Organization to provide equitable support and resources for both men's and women's hockey teams. Moderating today's session is Cadet First Class Kaylee Eskely from Cadet Squadron 11. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you Jocelyn and Monique Lamaru and C1C Eskely. Pass ahead to Monique Lamaru. She scores! And we are headed for a shootout. Oh my gosh. They are on pins and needles here. Jocelyn Lamaru. Come on, come on, come on, come on. She deeks and scores! The United States wins gold! That's electrifying. That's as good as you're going to see anywhere. For the Lamaru ladies stepped up gigantic in this gold medal game. Phenomenal performance by both of them. Dear Monique and Jocelyn, I heard about everything you went through to get to the Olympics. Dear Jocelyn, I'm from a small town too. We don't have a girls hockey team either, but that never stopped you. Dear Jocelyn and Monique, you didn't just play with the boys. You were two of the best players on the team. Makes me want to try out. Dear Monique, I read that when you were my age, girls weren't even allowed to play hockey in the Olympics. But you dreamed you'd do it anyways. Next biggest thing for us is the Olympics. My dream is to play in the Olympics. I can't believe you were willing to lose it all, to fight for girls like me. 
breaking news, USA women's hockey team taking a stand for gender equity. The team threatening to boycott to leverage for equal resources. Knowing this could cost them their shot at Olympic gold. We were fighting for equitable support within hockey, but that resonates and transcends sports. This just in. USA women's hockey team has won their fight for gender equity. Dear Monique and Jocelyn, you risked your dreams so that one day I'd have the chance to follow mine. Dear Jocelyn and Monique, you taught me that if I put my mind to it, I can be anything I want to be. Thank you for your courage. You guys are really brave. I stand up for myself now. You winning gold made me believe that I can get there someday. When I grow up, I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to break barriers. That video gets me every time. It's really, Same. truly yeah. amazing. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, it's obviously a huge honor for me to be on stage with you guys. And I know I speak on behalf of the cadets and um, everyone in the room when I say thank you for being here. We're really excited to hear from you today. So um, with that being said, we'll just get right into it. Um, so the first question, as we saw on the video there, um, you guys risk your dreams for everything to, um, in particular, boycott the 2017 World Championships. Um, you've been on the national team for a long time, since college, right? All four years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so could you walk us through what that was like, um, you as well as your teammates, making that decision to boycott the games and risking everything for that? Yeah, so it was actually... Oh. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, so what we saw, what you saw in the, the video, the 2017, and what led into that and the process is what um, a lot of people uh, don't really know about that, that part of it. And so um, we've been on the national team since 2009 time, so almost almost half of our lives now. We've been have dedicated uh, almost half our lives to being part of the national team program. And it's my we okay? <laughs> I think we are. Do you want me to use the handheld? Yeah, I'll yeah, use I'll the handheld. Use Here we go. Um, so, there we go. So, in 2015, so we graduated, had played in our second Olympics, uh, 2010, 2014, and after that, we, what we call as, as hockey players our, our postgraduate life, so we had finished up our NCAA eligibility, and we were continuing to train. We wanted to go for a, a third Olympics. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we were on silver in 2010, 2014, and in 2014, we were up two to nothing with less than five minutes left to go in the gold medal game. Canada tied it up two to two, and then we lost in overtime. So a heartbreaking loss for us. So we did not want to end our careers on that note. But uh, in continuing our hockey careers, we. Jocelyn had shoulder surgery shortly after the Olympics. Uh, we were finding jobs outside of hockey because we were not being compensated uh, as hockey players. And so our lives, we were working um, as strength and conditioning coaches. And we, we would get up at 4.30 in the morning. One of us would coach a group. We would then train ourselves, uh, get our training session in. We would go to the rink, have to get our skate in, which was usually just the two of us and maybe a goalie and then we would go back to work for the day. And that was kind of our normal uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's not all that glamorous. It's not all that fun uh, when you're in the grind of it uh, in the day-to-day -day of a season. And so pretty quickly we realized, like, this isn't right. We're some of the best hockey players in the world. It shouldn't be this hard to continue to play. And so uh, Jocelyn got the contact information of, of a Ballard Spar lawyer, uh, John Langle, who used to represent the US women's soccer team for almost 15 years. And so we contacted him. And then I'll let you take it away from there. Uh, yeah, so I had contacted some lawyers. And they agreed to represent us pro bono, because after giving them the um, basically all the background information about what it takes to be on the women's national team. They knew we couldn't afford their fee anyways. So 
they they offered right away to to put a team of lawyers together to work for our team and so ultimately to try and wrap this up because uh, we could have this conversation for an hour um, was we were in negotiations with USA Hockey for uh, about a year and a half um, having conference calls flying in for meetings and we had not made any significant progress and so we were asking for for three major things a uh, livable wage so that we wouldn't have to work a full-time job on top of training uh, more support for grassroots programs and more marketing for girls and women's hockey and the events that are going on we believe that if you if you promote a market uh, the games that we have coming up in major uh, cities in the u.s that people will come and we were just in anaheim two weeks ago and we broke the record had just under 14,000 fans um, in a 16,000 seat venue um, that was two weeks ago, and they marketed it, and people came. So we believe that if you if you put the effort in, that people want to come and watch us play. And so those were the three things we were asking for. We felt we hadn't made progress in a year and a half of negotiations. So ultimately, our entire team, our entire player pool, the U18 team, the U22 team, all said that we're not going to go compete in the World Championships. It's coming up in two weeks unless we make some significant progress. And so we, as, a, as an entire program, boycotted our world championship, or threatened to boycott our world championship. And fortunately, we were able to come to a four-year agreement. We signed four-year contracts, showed up in Detroit, had one practice, and we went on to win that world championship. Um, but that was, that's in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> what that video is about and ultimately if, if we had not come to an agreement we then further risked not just missing a world championship but put our Olympic dreams um, you know kind of up in the air as far as if we if we don't compete what's going to happen with the Olympics unfortunately we were able to come to an agreement but um, it was it was a it was a very stressful time and um, we believe that the contract that that we came in that we agreed to uh, is going to change women's hockey for the next generation. Oh, definitely. And <laughs> in that agreement that you reached with USA Hockey, I mean, arguably, it's one of the greatest achievements that women's hockey has, has reached thus far. Um, so we were talking earlier, and a day later, obviously, so you had this major win for women's hockey, and then a day later, actually, major setback for women's hockey. Um, so just to give the audience some background on the team, um, the University of North Dakota, their alma mater, they played three out of their four college years there. Um, they're consistently a top 10 ranked team. Um, they're ranked number six going into their final season. Um, they produced 12 Olympians in 15 seasons, including these two. Um, and then can you walk us through what happened? Yeah, so, uh, the previous year, 2000, I believe it was 2015-16 year, uh, UND had made, uh, the school-wide, not just the athletic department, had some major budget cuts, and I believe it was men's baseball and golf uh, were cut, but then the following year, there was still some major budgetary issues, and so we signed our contracts, we go to Michigan, and we get our, our phones are turned on, we're, we're getting ready to go to practice, it's... We're on a high just from everything that we'd accomplished over the last two, um, had been through over the last two weeks and what we were able to accomplish as a team. And then we're looking at our phones and there's rumblings that the, our, our team, UND uh, women's team had been cut. Jocelyn was working as their strength coach at the time, was in her third season working with the team. I was their volunteer assistant coach. And so we, there was some rumblings on Twitter. There was actually a, an official visit going on. A recruit was, had flown in and the players were actually on the ice during a skill set, doing a sk skill session with the coaches uh, when everybody started finding out. So that it basically broke via Twitter and rumors, and that's how players found out that the, the team had been cut. And so we're there, but then also we have five European players that are at the World Championships that now no longer have a college team to go back to uh, after the World Championships. And so for us, it was this huge victory followed by a major setback. And so it's 
We're, we're firm believers that if you can see it, you can be it. And you look at women's soccer and what they've accomplished since the 99 World Cup and the everything that they've been able to build off since then, what the WNBA is, is doing with the recent CBA negotiations and what that's going to do for the landscape of women's basketball. And so for us, it was it's the only Division I women's hockey program in the state. Uh, they also cut men's and women's swimming and diving, which was also the only swimming and diving program, Division I in the state. And so now you're eliminating three sports that kids in the North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming area that they no longer have athletes to, to aspire uh, that are at their fingertips to aspire to be like. And so that was a really big setback. But at the same time, we want to try and be a part of a solution to be to bringing that program back. Um, and if there's a positive way of doing that, then we want to be a part of it. And so we're kind of in the midst and in the weeds of figuring out how that process can be accomplished. But it's it, it's truly just in the middle of it. And so if the longer it goes without bringing the program back, the harder it'll be. But we're certainly not going to roll over on it. Awesome. So um, obviously boycotting 2017 World Championships as well as now with UND, um, you guys have spent a lot of time advocating for gender equity, but also equity in, in all areas of sport. Can you talk, us, talk to us a little bit about um, what your time doing this has taught you, um, not only about the sport, but um, about culture in general? Well, we were pretty fortunate. Our brother Jacques, or Captain Lamaru, um, is a teacher here, or yeah, teacher here. Um, he's back there with his mustache. Um, um, we grew up in a household where, so we had four older brothers, so Jacques, or Captain Lamaru, and three other brothers, and we grew up where we were provided every opportunity that our brothers were given. So we we grew up where equal was equal, and you get to try whatever your brothers are doing, and that's just how it was, and you get into the real world, and that's not how it is. And we, um, you know, our dad, in the context of hockey, always told us to make a difference. Uh, whatever you can do as a teammate, as a player, as an individual, make a difference. And our mom, in the dilemma of if we were in an individual sport, she didn't know who to cheer for, so she would say, I'm gonna cheer for the one behind. And, which I guess it's pretty good advice if you're a parent and you don't know who to cheer for. Um, so taking those lessons and just applying that to everything we do, we just started the Monique and Jocelyn Lamaru Foundation. And our mission is to um, give kids an opportunity in the, in the grand scheme of life, not just in sports, um, just a level playing field so that they can uh, reach their full potential. So. Uh, for this year, uh, we've decided to fund the lunch program in our hometown um, so that all kids get a hot lunch. There's no like cold lunch if you don't if you have a debt in your in your lunch account. And uh, if you think about what it takes for kids to be successful in school, um, probably not being hungry is, is one important part of that. And so we believe that you know every kid, no matter where they come from, no matter, uh, race, gender, they should be provided all the same opportunities to at least reach their full potential and then let their talents, you know, speak for themselves and ultimately that's just not the case uh, for, for a lot of individuals and so we're committed um, to making a difference um, and trying to cheer for the one behind in the, in the greater aspect of life and we hope that um, or, you know, we, we have these medals and, and they're great and they're, you know, a dream come true, but ultimately, you know, we, we put these away in our bags and no one's going to remember them in 10 or 15 years. Um, and certainly they're not coming to the grave with us. So what are we going to do with a platform that we've been given to make a difference? And, uh, you know, that's, that's ultimately what's important and what, and what really matters. So along those lines, I'd, I guess I'd ask, where do you think sport fits into society today? 
I think that it's a great question for us and our experiences. So when we were in uh, South Korea for the Olympics, um, the women's South Korean team actually played uh, as a unified team, and they had added it was seven to nine North Korean players to their roster about a month before the Olympics started. And so we were we actually had like a little team workout one day, and it's like a community weight room so there's speed skaters from there from the netherlands it's any sport from any country there's athletes in there working out at some point in the day and so we were actually warming up on the bikes and i was sitting on a bike next to a north korean hockey player and i kind of thought to myself I'm like there's probably nowhere else in the world that this is happening um and so when you think of what sports can do and it can bring countries together and it can be it can be a unification of countries. It can bring the world together in times of war and tragedy. And so for us to be able to kind of witness what happened with the, the unified women's team uh, and to see that play out through the Olympics, was it's, it's pretty eye-opening, and it gives you perspective. Like, we're, we get to, like Jocelyn was saying, like we, we get to play a sport. We accomplished our dreams as athletes, but at the end of the day, what are you doing as an athlete to make a difference? What are you doing to, to make positive changes, um, not just in sport or, like, I mean, as a teammate, um, you can go through, we could go through our athletic careers and you can think of the best teammates you ever had off the, the top of your head. Julie Chu would be probably number one on the list, but then you can also name the ones that maybe weren't so great and they'll come to mind just as quickly and how do you want to be remembered? Thank you. So I've been asking questions pretty steady since they got here, but we want to hear from, from the audience what questions you have for the Lamaru twins um, re relating to hockey, culture, any, anything really. Yes, sir. I, I think the important thing about what you said, and more importantly, your man standing up and saying that, um, it's, it's not, when we talk about gender equity, it's not just about women standing up and beating the drum, and sometimes, to be frank and honest, man-hating doesn't get us anywhere um, and it it takes men to be a part of the conversation when we're talking about diversity and inclusion it, it takes white people to stand up and say yeah this needs to change and sometimes tradition isn't always what's right and especially in historical institutions it's really hard to change that mindset and that culture but when you have diverse conversations and you have diversity around the table it helps bring everyone up, not just the majority, but the minority. So it takes, you know, what, what you just said, it takes a man to stand up and say, yeah, and encourage women to do that, but then for women to have the courage and stand up and raise their hand and speak up. Um, so thank you for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, and to go along with that, um, when we were in the midst, uh, when we told our family through a text message, we have a, a, too many people, there's a lot of people on it, um, like, we should probably let everyone know what was going on because our team had kept everything very much in-house up until a day or two before um, we announced we were not going to the world championships and we sent a text message out and then we went to our parents' house and our parents were very worried about us as individuals and what the ramifications it could have as, um, as in moving forward in our hockey careers and going to the Olympics. And our dad, at matter of fact, just goes, well, what if what if they replace you guys, which they were trying to do, and what if, you don't, what if you don't go to Worlds, what if you don't go to Olympics? And Jocelyn just right away turned and said, well, I can put my head on my pillow at night because I know we're doing the right thing. And we knew that as a group, we were doing the right thing, and if we as a group didn't come together with the veterans that we had and the great leadership that we had, if we're not willing to stand up and make change, then the next generation's not gonna do it. And so at some point, you have to be willing to stick your neck out there. And if everybody's willing to do it, they're pro you're probably gonna make some change and make some waves um, in the course of your actions. And so um, the power of being able to stick together as a group um, sometimes you have to do as an individual, but what we were to, what we were able to do collectively, because we, we stayed together, not one person strayed away from what the goal was. We were able to to make big changes, and ultimately, it's it's affected our careers for a very short period of time. But it's going to be game changing for the next generation.
While questions continue, Jocelyn and Monique have been kind enough to allow us an up-close look at their gold medals. The security team will assist in passing them from row to row. Thank you. Someone will chase you down if you try and run away with these. <laughs> Great, so while they're, do they're doing that, um, any other questions? Yeah. So in 2000, after the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake, uh, the players in Salt Lake City, the players um, had sought out representation um, and were ultimately gonna try and do what we did but what ended up happening leading into the 2006 Olympics, um, the players kind of fractured and some players, you know, they didn't, they didn't stand their ground. Um, they had, were, they were receiving pressure from the coach, you know, you guys need to show up, you need to be at practice, and this is, you know, you need to be grateful, that type of message. And so they had some players that were like, we just need to show up and, we just need to, you know, keep our mouth shut. So that's that's what happened in 06. And so what ended up happening was, um, slowly the the teams kind of started getting a little less and a little less um, as the years went on. And so that happened in 06. So then now we're on the team in 2010, and we're 19, don't know any better. 2014, we're starting to put things together, and then leading into 2018, it's like we've been on this team for eight to 10 years and we're still seeing no progress, what's going on here. Um, but yeah, I think unfortunately what happened in 06 set our sport and our national team program back. And fortunately we were able to, to make it work, but um, I guess when we boycotted the 2017 or threatened to boycott the 2017 World Championships, um, we had the entire national team, the U18 team, the U22 team, and then essentially they were trying to replace us so that they have a roster to be able to play. And so I would say that every American born player that was over the age of 18, uh, division one, I, division three club team player, um, had a chance of getting a phone call. And to our understanding and to all of our, the players that were a part of this, they didn't even have enough players that agreed to play to have a starting lineup on the ice. So to, I think that just speaks volumes to the message, what we were doing, the importance of it. We weren't dancing on the line of being right and wrong. We were completely in the right, and that's why so many people supported um, what we were doing. Um, but yeah, like the, going back to if, if 2006 had stayed together, if that team had you know, kept everything, everyone in the in the same boat, it, we probably wouldn't be have been in this situation, but it's, yeah, we were able to stick together. Questions? Yes, sir. As I understand it, checking is legal among the hockey team again. Uh, what are your opinions on that? <laughs> um, well, Per the rules, there is no checking. If you actually watch our games, there would be borderline. There is borderline checking. Depending on the refs, you will see open ice hits and full-blown checks against the boards, and they will not call it. Um, so it really, for us, it, it really does a disservice to the game when the, the refing has been very inconsistent over the years, which is unfortunate, but um, the games do get physical. Um, yeah, anybody that says there's no checking just really doesn't watch women's hockey, and it's it, you just kind of shake your head and laugh, I guess. Um, well, so we grew up playing checking because we are playing with boys, so we grew up playing hockey with checking, um, and so I would say it has nothing to do with the anatomy of women not being able to hit. I would say that. Um, if you understand the game of hockey and how the game has transitioned and gotten fast over the last 10 years, it requires more skill and being a smarter player to be able to play without checking than it does with. Um, and it's a, you, ha you have to be able to play with more skill um, simply because you can't just run into people. You have to be able to, you know, 
take angles and all that. Um, but I personally think women's hockey, is, it's gotten so much faster. It's gotten so much more skilled since we've been a part of the national team program. And adding checking, I think, takes away from that when there's a disparity uh, on the world stage from the top teams to the bottom teams. Um, and so I think it, it I think it lends itself to more skill in the game. Um, and even in the NHL and in college hockey, it's changing now. There's, there's less big hits. The game has gotten a lot faster and a lot more skilled um, in the last 10 years with some of the rule changes. Um, I was growing up, um, we like to say that our brothers in their own individual way uh, were really good role models for us and we like to think that we took like the best pieces of their game and that's a part of our game so uh, no one would have seen uh, Captain Lamru play here at Air Force, I don't think, maybe some of the, the teachers and the professors, but um, He's pretty good around the net, and we think we, we, we have that skill. And then our, our brother Pierre Paul was a tough defenseman, and we think we play with that tenacity and toughness. And I could go on with Mario and, and Phil, but um, we think that we, we just grew up. We were all in such a tight age that we grew up with really good role models of what it meant to you know work towards a dream. Jacques had a, a handwritten um, piece of notebook paper taped on his door and it just got taken off like two years ago because our parents remodeled their house. And it was like, I'm gonna run, I don't know, I don't remember exactly what it was. It was like shoot 200 pucks a day, I'm gonna do weight training. And it was just written down, and it was just slapped on the door. And they just took, my parents just took it off the door like <laughs> two years ago. So it was probably like 20 years old. It was like yellow and crusty, the piece of paper. But th that was the type of example we had to follow that we, you know, saw in our household. And, um, you know, we're just fortunate. It was a little bit of nature nurture. And we just grew up with, uh, you know, competitive brothers who worked really hard to try to make it to the next level in their sport. And we just thought, you know, okay, this is how it's done. So this is what we're going to do. Yeah, and, the, and then I think in the sporting aspect, as we've gotten older, um, we think of um, Julie Foudy, who used to play on the U.S. soccer team. She works for ESPN now. Um, and actually, uh, Jackie joyner Kersey. So since the Olympics, Joss and I uh, were, uh, work with Comcast Corporate Values Initiatives and have been heavily involved in their um, Internet Essentials program. And the last two years, we've gone to over like 20 different cities and we go to a lot of inner inner city schools that are really uh, low income areas and we're able to we go to classrooms and we 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 do laptop giveaways where we give like 100 to 200 laptops away to these kids that and and internet access and the program provides internet access uh, to low income Americans at a, a very discounted rate and so um, I think the common misconception um, is that every everybody has access to the internet and a tool to access the internet and so being a part of that program we've been able to see the impact that something is what we would, might think as little as internet access can have on the trajectory of a child's education. But through that program, we met Jackie Joyner Kersey, and um, our mom actually gave us her book when we were in middle school. We were too young to have watched her compete in any of the four Olympics she was in, but uh, through meeting her, we've seen what she's done through her foundation. She's from East St. Louis, and she started a community center after she retired from track and field, and she has thousands of kids who come through her program. Her, her community center is a stop on the bus line, and so what she's been able to do uh, since she retired and the impact that she's had in her community is is pretty tremendous and so to to have had the opportunity to meet people like that 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 have used their platform to to make positive changes and truly just want to help others that may need a helping hand or need a, a level playing field uh, that's uh, we're inspired by that and hope to to take lessons from people that have done um, such amazing things like that Last question, please. Yeah, in the middle. 
Yes, we we bicker and fight. Um, we have a very quick rebound rate. Um, I would say that ultimately, uh, we always have uh, we we always agree on the big picture, um, and so I think that's why you, we do like the normal sibling argue arguing about nothing, like stupid things, but. I would say when there's an agreement, a disagreement, um, it ultimately we want the same thing, and pretty much our entire lives have had the same big goals, um, and so we've maybe not agreed on how to get there, but we both agree on where we're going. So it's just a matter of figuring out, um, you know, best best steps forward. And I think that goes to you know any type of team setting. Ultimately, there's you know, a big picture, a true north, what you guys want to accomplish, and there might be multiple ways to get there, but ultimately you have to agree on path, the path forward, and everyone has to be on board. You can't be trying to get to the same place, taking five different routes. Um, and so we've, yeah, we argue, but ultimately we have the same ambitions, the same goals. We were cut from the same cloth. I, I mean, yeah, we're sisters and twins, but like we're, you know, what what drives us, it's the same. It's not necessarily winning medals and scoring goals. It's about making a difference. And so that's you know, that's what we're all about. And so ultimately, um, our, our arguments don't last long. And yeah. <laughs> Jocelyn and Monique, thank you again for your time this morning. C1C Eskely, thank you for moderating this session. On behalf...